Good to see you, everyone. My name is Robbie Howell. I am a tabletop game designer, a lover of history, and a lifelong player of Age of Empires 2. And on this series, Theory Crafting, I take a look at civilizations and units not yet present in AOE 2 and try to create a realistic and historically accurate framework for how they might possibly look if someday they were to be implemented into the game we know and love so well. Today, we are looking at one of the most requested civilizations on my channel, one that I have been assured by several commenters is a mainstay of Age of Empires 3 crafting. You guys have mentioned it a number of times in comments before. I've been putting it off for far too long, so today, let us together take a look at... The Armenians. Yes, indeed, the Armenians. A people stuck at a crossroads between mighty rivals for pretty much all of their medieval history. As always, for disclaimers on this build and a summary of my philosophy when theorycrafting, please take a look on screen right now. And make sure to check out the comprehensive civilization document linked down in the description below. It has all of my sources as well as details on all of the specific mechanics and such that you will encounter in this build. And also, before I forget, I have just launched the pre-launch page to my upcoming Kickstarter for my own tabletop role-playing game, Enclave. It's a game that means an awful lot to me, and I'll be talking about it a little more in the coming months. Hopefully the campaign will be dropping this August. But until then, if you want to go take a brief gander at my pre-launch page and maybe hit follow if you want more notifications, go take a look at the link down in the description below. With all that being said, let us move on to a summary of Armenian history. The Armenian Plateau, which you can see nestled right about here, has been occupied since time immemorium and has seen powerful empires rise and fall since around 1500 BC. But that's way before the AOE2 relevant time frame. Around 400 AD, where I call the beginning of the AOE2 relevant time frame, we find Armenia having just been divvied up between the Byzantines and Persians in the late 300s, following one of their many conflicts over the region. In the following years, Armenia would become a strange link between these two mighty rivals, not only serving as a frequent battleground for them, but also being one of the few ways that the two could trade and interact. It was considered something of a neutral ground between them. Even though half of Armenia was Byzantine, the other half was controlled by Persia. The Armenians had also adopted Christianity in the 300s, but Persian pressure in the eastern half of the country would become a recurring issue over the next couple hundred years, with massive religious persecution becoming fairly par for the course. 400s also saw the end of a fairly long-lived Armenian ruling dynasty, the Arsacids, and the rise of the Mamakonian dynasty, promoted by the Persians, who had always been quite relevant, but now had their turn at the throne. The Mamakonians were not Persian pawns, in fact they were rather well supported by the Byzantines, and they played kind of a cautious game of rebellion, leading up to Armenia actually gaining a decent amount of autonomy under their Persian rulers in around the late 400s AD. But, as is going to be a recurring theme with Armenian history, this autonomy did not last for long. And Byzantine encroachments would take more and more of the country over the coming centuries, substantially diminishing Persian power over that time, but they were on their way down in the first place, especially with the onset of Islam in the south. The Rashidun Caliphate toppled Persia in 637 AD before embarking on a 10-year-long conquest north, taking, among many other things, Armenia. Armenia would enjoy a decent amount of autonomy under their Arab rulers at first, at the very least, up until they tried to get a little bit too saucy and side more with their Byzantine neighbors against the Arabs, leading to them being put completely under the boot hill of the Umayyad dynasty after it took the reins of Islam in the late 600s AD. Once again, now Armenia was divided, this time between the Byzantines and the Arabs. And while the Armenians tended to sympathize more with the Byzantines and the prolonged Arab-Byzantine war, War, that isn't to say that they were best buds with either. The Khazars also entered the picture, with the Umayyads trying to pass through Armenia to defeat their Khazar opponents, and the Khazars eventually kicking them out and retaliating with a conquest of Armenia of their own, though this one didn't last nearly as long as many of the other larger occupations that the nation had seen up until this point. It is also in the late 700s that the Mamakonian dynasty was bumped, replaced with a number of years of governorship and interregnum, though once again the country did enjoy 
enjoy a fairly surprising level of autonomy due to the fact that the Umayyads were then booted in the south by the Abbasid Caliphate, which would proceed to rule Islamic Arabia for a couple hundred years. Finally, though, in the mid-800s AD, a new dynasty arose in Armenia, the Bagratid dynasty. And they were, for the first time in centuries, recognized as the autonomous independent rulers of Armenia by both the Byzantines and the Arabs, the two most powerful and important neighbors the country had at the time. And this independence led to a substantial, if short-lived, golden age, with the country prospering and flourishing over the next couple decades. However, by the 900s, cracks had started to form. Splinter kingdoms were starting to arise, rival clans were starting to try to take power from the Bagratids, and the Byzantines, sensing weakness, started to vacuum up splinter kingdoms and absorb them into their own borders. The Arabs weren't much of a threat anymore, and now Armenia really only had to worry about the Byzantines until just a couple years later when the Turks appeared on the horizon. They obviously rampaged through the Middle East for a few decades, culminating in the Great Battle of Manzikert, in which Armenia did participate quite heavily, which diminished Byzantine influence within the region to a fraction of what it had been before. And then after the Turks took their time stomping through Armenia, the Georgians took a turn stomping through Armenia. They had had close diplomatic relations with Armenia for quite some time and absorbed much of Armenia into their borders for a period during the 11 and 1200s. But though they had many more cultural ties to Armenia than its other neighbors, this was not an entirely peaceful process, as you might imagine. Now, while all this was happening in Armenia proper, a second Armenia joins the picture, that being Lesser Armenia, a breakaway faction led by a young Armenian noble, who we'll talk about a little more later, who moved south to Cilicia on the southern Turkish coast and established their own small, fairly successful kingdom. It would, of course, be trampled over plenty of times going forwards in future, like the rest of Armenia had as well, but it had a more strategically defensible location, which the Armenians proceeded to fortify the absolute hell out of, and soon started to play host to all manner of crusaders starting to pass through en route, and while plenty of them were not welcome guests, they tended to be on fairly good terms with Lesser Armenia writ large. And Lesser Armenia was a minor player within a number of crusades to come, harboring crusaders, providing them with resources, sending troops, and similar. Though, of course, they were targeted by the crusaders fairly frequently as well. But getting back to normal Armenia, where were we? Ah, yes, the Georgians. Then the Mongols came trampling through, and they ruled for a hundred odd years. And then the Timurids came through, and they ruled for a hundred odd years. Oh, and then the Mamluks conquered Lesser Armenia for a little while. They were annoying as well. And then they got booted by the Timurids, who then proceeded to get booted by the Ottomans and the Safavids. Oh yeah, and then Constantinople fell at some point. That was a problem. And every single one of these massive powers stomped through Armenia on their way to smashing their other surrounding neighbors, only to turn around after finishing their conquest and realizing, hmm, this is a very important region, let's make sure we hold on to this as well. Meaning that Armenia remained the primary battleground for many major wars within the Middle East right up until the end of the AOE2 relevant time frame. In fact, a major war would break out in Armenia against the Ottomans right in 1602, just after what I call the tail end of the AOE2 relevant time frame. But suffice within all of this to say that after 1375-ish, there was no independent Armenian state, either Lesser Armenia or the kingdom proper. That isn't to say, though, that the Armenian people were altogether unprosperous. In fact, Armenian emigration became the norm, with the diaspora spreading out all across the world as far as Poland and Spain and Egypt and well beyond that following the AOE2 timeframe. And wherever they went, they tended to find great success, becoming ranking officers in the military and even acting as diplomatic and economic middlemen more broadly between some of the greatest powers the world has ever known. That being said, Armenia has continued to be ravaged by horrible wars for the vast majority of its modern history as well, culminating in many horrific tragedies, and yet somehow its people always have and continue to remain enterprising, prosperous, and proud, despite the horrors that have befallen their homeland. With that all being said, let's move on to the flavor, the lovely aesthetic details that make an Age of Empires civilization what it is. Their architecture is Central Asian, with unique skins for the castle. 
and nothing else. As I'll get to later, I am not fully satisfied with these choices, but we'll talk about that in the loose threads section. Their language will be Old Armenian, Old Joyun, ladies and gentlemen, and their wonder would be the gorgeous Saint Gayan Church, one of many spectacular pieces of classical Armenian architecture. I believe this one dating back to the eight or 900s AD. There are a lot of churches in this similar style. You could pick your favorite. I just went with the one that I thought looked most wonder-ish. In terms of their AI player names, I have a couple floating on screen right now. Take a look if you have any interest. And of course, a reminder to take a look at the civilization document if you want to see any of this information in more detail. With that being said, let's move on to some possible campaigns for the Armenians as a civilization, beginning with Ashot the Great the first king of a unified, independent Armenia. This was again in the mid-800s. Ashot was a noble who rose to prominence after being voted by his fellow nobles across all clans as the only man that they would agree on trusting to rule Armenia. And from there, he was even accepted by, as mentioned, the Byzantines and Arabs, their strongest neighbors at the time, as being a legitimate ruler, even referred to by his Arab neighbors as the Prince of Princes. He went on to be a major player in the Arab-Byzantine wars, mostly fighting on the Byzantine side, and under his rule, the country absolutely flourished, leading to that golden age I mentioned earlier. Though, of course, as with all good things in Armenia, that was not to last, and he died fighting some of the early splinter kingdoms that would go on to completely undermine the state that he had worked so hard to build. He is a classic unifier of the people figure and would make for a great conventional campaign, but I can think of one that would be a little bit more interesting, that being Prince Reuben. This fellow came about a good bit later in the 1000s-ish AD, around the time when the Turks were rampaging around following the Battle of Manzikert. After that calamitous loss, Reuben mustered as many Armenians as would follow his banner and tromped southwest, making his way to the southern Turkish coast in what we know as Cilicia and founding the kingdom of Lesser Armenia. From there, not only would he have many interesting diplomatic relations with the Turks and Byzantines, both of whom would press his borders very, very hard, but he found a lot of unlikely allies and enemies among the Crusaders. I think a Prince Reuben campaign would be extremely cool. You'd have that nomadic beginning, settling a new land, fighting off your very powerful rivals who are sniffing at your front door, and then dealing with all these strange foreigners from Europe, making their way through to the Holy Land to seek their fortunes. I love the idea, and in fact, Prince Ruben gets my pick for the campaign I would most want to see representing Armenia in the game. Let's now talk about some potential appearances for this Armenian Civ in current campaigns. We got Tamerlane 5. Armenia is listed by name in that scenario. It's a perfect fit. But unfortunately, that's it. There are no other places currently in game that I saw the Armenians fitting. That being said, before we wrap out this flavor section, I want to mention a couple other lesser campaign ideas that are very cool, but I don't think have quite the same amount of oomph as either Ashot or Ruben. First one being Zeba. She was a princess of Lesser Armenia, again, Cilician Armenia, and has one of the most sordid relationship stories I have ever read about in the Middle Ages being traded between six or seven different prominent rulers among fellow Armenians, Crusaders, Byzantines, frickin' everyone, before settling down with, like, her cousin once removed or something, forming a political union that united Lesser Armenia and led to it experiencing another pretty substantial golden age. She played a pretty big role for a queen, and under her rule, Lesser Armenia had quite a lot to do with the Crusades, since in the course of being traded around, she made a lot of relationships with different crusading kings. A really interesting character. You could play up maybe the soap opera style elements of it if you wanted to do something really different, but if we're being honest, it's kind of messed up. So maybe talking about the realities and horrors of arranged marriage in the Middle Ages could be another possibly more valid way of going about such a campaign. Would be remiss not to mention it though. Second of all, the Armenian emperors. Did you know there were three different Byzantine emperors of Armenian origin? The first being Leo V, a military commander who saved the Byzantines from the Bulgars in the early 800s before being assassinated seven years after taking the throne. Second being Basil I, who betrayed the current emperor in the late 800s, going on to strengthen the navy and bring about a bunch of legal reforms before also being assassinated. And last being Emperor Romanos, who ruled a whopping 24 years from 920 to 944 AD. 
AD. Though a usurper, he was actually very popular, gaining approval through his favor of the peasantry and mediation of conflicts both within the Byzantine church and with more invading Bulgars, and he actually stepped down peacefully, though not before marrying off his daughter to the legitimate emperor's heir, meaning that his line continued to be a part of Byzantine history for many decades to come. Really interesting. I could see maybe like two scenarios for each of these three famous emperors and maybe comparing and contrasting what they did well and poorly, as well as the many interesting through lines through them. Like, I think they were all high profile military commanders that the Byzantines recruited from among Armenia's elite, which as you'll see, was a fairly common thing they did. And lastly, Vardan Mamikonian, a member of the Mamikonian dynasty ruling under late Persian rule, who led a hopeless rebellion against his Zoroastrian oppressors and was promptly massacred, along with a bunch of other Armenian Christians. This would be a single scenario rather than a whole campaign, and should certainly end in you losing horribly. But Vardan went on to be remembered as a famous Christian martyr and saint. And maybe it could play something like those special event scenarios, like for Barbarossa 1 and stuff, where you're just trying to get as high a score as possible. Like, see how long you hold out against the Persians with your humble little revolt before getting stomped into the dust and being a martyr. Something like that, I think, could be really, really great. And with all that, let's move on to the major themes, some underlying through lines that I saw passing through all elements of Armenian history, beginning with them being the crossroads of conquest. I've harped on about this a lot, but the poor Armenians have really got the short end of the stick, geographically speaking. They are in a really important location, stuck between some of the most powerful empires that history has ever seen, who both want to kill each other, and by proxy the annoying Armenians standing in their way. They were, of course, particularly involved with the Byzantines. Like I said, there were some emperors among them. The Byzantines hired countless Armenian generals, governors, and mercenaries, but despite this very, very deep entwining between the two, the Armenians never assimilated. They remained firm and proud and autonomous in their culture and society, even when the Byzantines tried to levy legal reforms to change their social structure itself didn't quite work. This leads us to our second major point, resistance, fierce resistance. The Armenians, despite being conquered so much, certainly don't like being conquered. They defied their conquerors on every occasion, constantly revolting against religious persecution and military occupation and demands for tribute. In fact, defiant really is the word for it. I can't think of a single more defiant people that I have seen all throughout history than the Armenians. And in honesty, it's pretty admirable. I even saw a quote attributed to a Byzantine king contacting the Persian emperor and advising him to send more Armenian levies to his far distant fronts to have them die, kind of conspiring with the Persians to get rid of the Armenians, who he described as a perverse and unruly nation which stirs up trouble between us. And stirring up trouble against their oppressors is definitely something the Armenians are very good at. In fact, according to another source, the Armenians were described by other neighbors as being unruly and individualistic. I'm sure their frustrated conquerors had many nastier things to call them than just that. Lastly, I want to talk about heredity and hierarchy. Armenia was an incredibly hierarchical society from well before the AOE2 relevant time frame. They had many major, prominent, powerful clans who had tons of internal squabbles, but all had a distinct pecking order. Even when you saw, for example, the Bagratid dynasty taking over in the mid-800s AD, they had a couple of clans right below them on the ladder who were able to actually pretty effectively resist their rule and were responsible for many of those early splinter kingdoms. This also leads to the Armenians being known for having some of the most elite soldiers in all the Middle East, stratified by both their clan and their rank within the clan. These elite soldiers were contracted by militaries as far away as Germany to serve in warfare as mercenaries, which they were incredibly good at, not to mention fighting valiantly for their homeland against its many, many conquerors over the years. And with all that, we come to the end of this history section for the Armenians. Thank you guys so much for watching. If that's all you were here for, please remember to like and subscribe before you go. Oh, and remember once again to go take a look at the pre-launch page for my Kickstarter for my own tabletop role-playing game Enclave, the full campaign of which will likely be launched in August of this year. But for all of those of you who, like me, love Age of Empires and want to see what I've done with the Armenians, let's move on to game mechanics, beginning with some necessary updates. The Armenians would receive a regional building, that being the Caravanserai, which I mentioned initially in my Swahili's build. Go take a look at that here if you haven't seen it 
already. If you don't know about my proposed change for this particular building, it would look very similar to how it does now, but it would have a longer build time and its aura would apply to all units, though it would be shorter range, have less HP regen and give less speed. But all of those aura benefits, including its range, are doubled for trade units, meaning that it still is very, very good at boosting trade. In fact, it's even better at boosting trade than it was before. But its cost has been upped to compensate for this added utility. In addition to the Armenians and a couple other of my own builds, this new Caravanserai would be gained by the Berbers, Hindustanis, Persians, Saracens, and Tatars, though I could see other civilizations getting it as well. An awesome late game eco building, the Caravanserai was one of my favorite additions in the Dynasties of India expansion, and I don't see why more civilizations shouldn't share the love, because these buildings were absolutely everywhere along the Silk Road, and I think many other civilizations could greatly benefit from getting access to them. With that said, let's move on to an overview of the Armenians, an elite and defensive civilization. For those of you who are new here, when I say elite, I am referring to infantry, archers, and cavalry that have a gold cost. Not monks, not siege, not ships, and not trash units, or levies as I like to call them. Let's go on to the Armenians' first bonus. Kind of a complicated one. Every eighth elite unit of a single type trained is a stronger Azat. Every 25th one trained is a much stronger Naksharar. The Azat and Naksharar would be prefixes to a unit. For example, Azat Knight, or Naksharar Step Lancer, or something along those lines. And an Azat would be indicated by a little silver crown, both above the unit's model in-game and on their unit icon. Naksharar would be the same, but with a gold crown. When I say type, I mean if you train seven men-at-arms, then the eighth men-at-arms or long swordsman you train would be an Azat. And likewise for the Naksharar. And again, this applies to all infantry, archers, and cavalry that have a gold cost. So what would an Azat and a Naksharar be? They would effectively just be souped up versions of the unit you trained with much higher HP and attack. And in the case of the Naksharar, even a good amount of health regeneration, effectively making it like a mini hero. So, what the heck is this bonus about? Well, the Azat were minor nobility, whereas the Naksadar were major nobility within Armenia, both of whom fought on the battlefield in all manner of different roles. And so this bonus is trying to capture the hierarchical nature of these various nobles' presence within all branches of the Armenian military. They wore many hats and were some of the most elite troops that Armenia had to offer both against its foes and as mercenaries. Second bonus. Treadmill Crane is free and has double the effect. That means plus 40% build speed, but only in Castle Age, unlike the Spanish bonus, which is 30% from the beginning of the game. Armenia saw a number of periods of major internal reconstruction, with a lot of beautiful architecture being created, especially between like the 800 to 1000s AD when it was an independent kingdom. Plus, when the Armenians first moved into Cilicia, founding Lesser Armenia, they fortified the region at an absolutely staggering rate. Fortress building was unsurprisingly very common across all of Armenia due to how often they were invaded, but the rate at which they were able to erect these structures is pretty remarkable, hence me wanting to give them an effect that improved their build rate. Third bonus, armor upgrades also reduce bonus damage taken by minus one, two, three respectively, culminating in a total of minus six once you research all armor upgrades in Imperial Age. Wow, that's quite strong. That means that if you have fully upgraded paladins, they're taking six less bonus damage from halberdiers, and that can really stack up. This is, again, trying to account for how elite Armenian military men were, as well as just how much armor Armenian soldiers were known for wearing. Since all of their noble families fielded powerful regiments of household troops, they were able to equip them in some of the best gear known to the world at the time. And as such, it's going to be a lot harder to counter Armenian troops once they get fully upgraded. Upgraded. Though, as you see, this is not going to be as devastating in Trash Wars as you might expect. Fourth bonus, town centers drain the hit points of enemy units within their line of sight by 1% per second, and buildings by 10% per minute. This is going to be particularly deterring for enemy rushes, especially tower rushes, which will just crumble over time once the Armenian's player picks up Town Watch. It's going to be less powerful late game, but does open some interesting forwarding options if you want to try to stick a town center on top of your enemy's base or something like that, though obviously it's probably going to go down pretty fast. And what this is trying to represent is just how hard it was to occupy Armenia, even for some of the greatest powers in the world. 
constantly revolting, constantly trying to boot you out of their homeland, and because of this, this HP drain is just trying to represent all of the little partisan guerrilla fighters who are likely attacking any enemy soldier who would pass into Armenian territory, even during times of total domination and conquest. Onto their team bonus. Losing a town center restores 10% HP to all of the owner's units map-wide, and losing a castle restores 20%. That means that if you're on the back foot during a massive push in mid or late game, your army might suddenly get a huge second wind once your opponent brings down some of your key strategic buildings. And this is once again trying to represent how hard it was to invade Armenia. Even taking key strategic locations like their capital cities and major fortresses would not break their fighting spirits. This applies to their team as well because Armenia was very much a bulwark for whatever nation was most in power over it at the time, usually the Byzantines. These great powers knew that enemies would usually have to come through Armenia to get to them, piggybacking off this stickiness and resistance to conquest for their own benefit. Let's take a look now at their unique options, beginning with their unique unit, the Ayrudzi. This is a cavalryman armed with a mace, shield, and very heavy armor. He costs 40 food and 60 gold. Very, very cheap for a heavy cavalryman, but he is slower than average, slower even than the knight, though with even higher hit points. He does, however, have low attack and low rate of fire, making his overall damage output worse even than a light cavalryman, but he has a little bit of bonus damage versus enemy elites, namely units that cost gold, and he can never deal less than four minimum damage. Maces are pretty hard to completely block with armor, and as such, the Ayrudzi, while it won't be nearly as impactful as a Lightus would, it will still be able to trade effectively versus very heavily armored enemies due to its own high HP and low cost, letting it grind out fights far more effectively while being way worse at things like raiding and flanking. The Ayrudzi also has another interesting power. You can task it to garrison in an ally's town center, something that cavalry cannot obviously do, to donate the Ayrudzi to that ally. They don't have to pay anything. You lose the unit, they get the unit. Very, very cool. Obviously, this is not always going to be helpful because, I mean, you still spent the resources for it, but this can allow you to do cheeky things like, for example, let your ally share partially in micro during a battle or allow them to bypass their population cap if they've maxed out at 200. Donate them 40 Ayrudzi, they're at 240 population and you're at 160, so you can rebuild some more just opening up a couple more interesting team options, and is of course in reference to Armenian elites, particularly their cavalry, having great renown as mercenaries all over Europe and beyond. Lastly, let's take a look at their unique text, beginning with their castle age unique technology, Zoranamak. This was a military document recounting troop numbers and positioning, and it would make it once researched that elite units slowly refund their gold cost. This would mean that over the course of five minutes, if you can keep that elite unit alive, it will generate a trickle of gold equivalent to the amount that you spent on it. Though, of course, if it dies, or once it reaches its price tag, this trickle will subside. Since so many Armenians were fighting abroad as mercenaries, you can imagine that they brought back quite a lot of wealth to their homeland, hence this mechanic of a unit being able to pay for itself the longer it manages to stay alive. Their Imperial Age technology, on the other hand, is called Kayayut Ilne. This is an oath of fidelity or service sworn by lesser Armenian clans to whatever ruling Armenian clan was in place at the time, and it would not only allow your Azat and Naxadar to to spawn more often, representing more noble troops being conscripted for the ruling family's banner, but it will also make it such that if an Azat, Naxerar, or Monk dies, nearby allies within about five tiles will gain a brief bonus to their attack rate. This lasts quite a short period and scales from 5% for an Azat to 20% for a Naxerar, but it can stack. So if you have a ton of Azats die, then your units are going to be machine gunning for about 10 seconds before the effects wear off. This last effect is in reference to the Armenian tradition of dying as a martyr. We saw it with Vardan Mamakonian earlier on, but it's something that you see come up semi-frequently in Armenian history, as they were not only often conquered, but also very frequently religiously persecuted, hence the monk side of this story as well. A really cool effect that will reward you for strategically massing up and making use of your special elite units as well as your monks, and having a cool unified army comp capitalizing on timings, and not being quite as badly crippled by some of your best units biting the dust. As always, make sure to check out the civilization document down below if you want any more details on any of these bonuses or texts. And with all that being said, let's move on to the Armenians' tech tree letter grades, beginning with their infantry. It's a B minus. They don't have pikemen. They have 
Turk tier levies in general, as we'll get into more later. Not only do their spearmen not benefit from any of their bonuses, besides arguably the armor one, but their spearmen, it's not very good. Their swords, on the other hand, are fully upgraded and benefit in full from the Azat Naxedar bonus, as well as both unique technologies, and the bonus damage reduction thing from armor. Though for infantry, anti-infantry damage is not nearly as common as anti-archer and cavalry damage, so it's not going to be as impactful. Their archers, on the other hand, are a C+. They have Thumb Ring, they have Parthian Tactics, ooh, but they don't have Crossbowmen. <gasps> They're stuck with Archers, and they don't have Elite Skirmishers. Oh, disaster, and Hand Cannon, oh no. Lastly, they don't have the final Archer Armor upgrade, so their Cavalry Archers, while very good, won't be able to get the full minus six bonus damage reduction that their Infantry and Cavalry will enjoy from their Armor bonus. That being said, their Cavalry Archers are quite good. Thumb Ring, Parthian Tactics, various Elite bonuses, bonus damage reduction, which is really helpful for Cavalry Archers to make them more resistant to both the Spear and Skirm line. So even though I could not justify giving them higher than a C+, missing almost every unit in the Archery range, the one that they are good with, the Cavalry Archer, is actually very respectable. Next, Cavalry. It's a B+. They have their unique Ayrudzi, as well as the Camel Rider and Step Lancer, though missing the elite upgrades for both. But their Hussars and Paladins are both fully upgraded and benefit enormously from that armor bonus, as well as the Ayrudzi and Paladin getting all those elite benefits that I have enumerated many times before. Overall, I think the Armenians are usually going to play as a cavalry civilization with champions and heavy cavalry archers in the back pocket if they need to. Siege. It's a B minus. They have siege engineers. Yay! But they miss siege ram, siege onager, and bombard cannon. Boo. You really want to have at least one of those options, but having siege engineers is nice. Defenses. It's an A. They have their treadmill crane bonus, which is very, very strong. And though they lack town patrol, which is obviously a big bummer because of their TC aura effect, they have a perfect university besides bombard tower. The TC drain effect is going to be very impactful to Armenian defenses, especially once they hit castle age and can start dropping more town centers. While not having town patrol sucks, if they had it, it would allow the TC to drain at an enormous range, so I didn't really feel it was justified giving them that technology. Plus, having that TC castle on destruction bonus is going to give them some incremental benefits if their enemy is pushing them hard on the back foot in mid or late game. Next up, their economy. It's a D plus. It's poo poo. They have no eco bonus. No, but they also miss crop rotation, gold shaft mining, and two man saw in late game. The only eco thing this civilization has is their elite units refunding their gold cost over time which is nice, don't get me wrong, but if you want to maximize it, it will lead to a much slower playstyle or a very high micro playstyle to make sure that you keep every individual one of your units alive. Could work well for some players, not going to work well for all. Levies, very bad. <laughs> I'm not going to say truly the worst in the game because their Hussars are very good and they benefit from the armor bonus, but not having pikemen or elite skirmisher, plus missing a bunch of late game economy techs, which is really useful in trash wars, means that the Armenians are gonna have some of the worst trash in the game, certainly some of the worst that I've ever created for a civilization, firmly putting their levies in the day tier. Doc, it's a B, surprisingly good. The Armenians had a lot more to do with water than I would have guessed going into this build, especially within their roles as admirals and generals among the Byzantines. They have access to the Catapult Galley, a regional unit I created. In fact, I probably should have mentioned this in my necessary update section. Oopsies, my bad. If you wanna learn more about my vision for the Catapult Galley and how it will differ from the Dromon, take a look at my Khazars build, a link to which will be found up here. They do miss Shipwright, but other than that, they have a perfect dock. Yay, very serviceable. They don't have an eco bonus, probably will be bad on water because of that. Monks, it's a B plus. Perfect monk tree. Plus they have Kayoyut in, which is not going to be like a huge monk bonus, but it's going to be marginally useful at times. But since monks are usually only good for monk things, it's not necessarily something you're going to want to shape your strategy around when you're playing the civilization. Much better to focus on your elites and your defenses. Now let's take a look at their playstyle. Beginning in early game, the Armenians would likely be pretty bad. They don't have an eco bonus. They have below average rushes because no crossbow to tech their archers into, no pikemen or elite skirmisher to tech their early trash into, and none of their military bonuses really kick in hard until you can start massing things up. That being said, they are pretty good at deterring rushes. Their TC aura is going to make sure that enemies have a much harder time keeping their men-at-arms or towers healthy, especially after Town Watch is picked up. And in a long feudal war where you might be able to get out an Azat or two, the Armenians might be able to actually get a little bit of ground. Having a super unit in a feudal age fight actually sounds pretty nasty to me. And you can mass up a bunch of archers with the Armenians if you're never planning on hitting Castle Age, so hey, you might be able to make it work. 
Uh, in terms of the mid-game, on the other hand, the Armenians will start to get very scary. They have many powerful elite options. Knights, Cav Archers, Aridzi, Champion? That should be a long swordsman. My bad. Not to mention they also get access to Zoranamak if they want to try to play a more micro-heavy game of keeping individual elites alive to refund their gold cost while they're going around raiding. I think this will be especially good with knights and cavalry archers who have a high gold price tag and are a lot easier to stay alive because of how fast and beefy they are. They do also start to get more benefit from their armor reducing bonus damage effect, which will definitely make their elites even tougher to crack. That being said, this army comp, while it's very strong, has a high upfront cost, especially if you want to make enough units to get a few Azads or Naxaras out on the field. Your other goal as the Armenians is to expand your borders. Your treadmill crane bonus should allow you to build very, very quickly, throwing up town centers and castles wherever you possibly can. The town centers will of course have the drain effect and help compensate for your lack of eco bonus with a nice fat boom. And castles, despite being fully upgraded, will obviously be key strategic points for you. Your opponent won't be able to bring one down without the fear that your army will suddenly be in much better shape. You can even try to do a cheeky forward town center if you're brave. Stick a town center behind the enemy woodline and drain their villagers. Hilarious, but probably very impractical. On to the late game, however, the Armenians will probably have just about the same game plan, but better. They have all those scary elites, which only get stronger with Kayagot Ion and the final armor upgrades, making them even more dangerous to take head on. Plus, they'll still have very respectable defenses. And it is a lot easier to mass up huge elite armies in late game when you have a huge economy, and presumably Zoranamak will be able to refund a lot more gold to you. But in post-Imperial, they'll start to fall off. Their trash is a bad. Their Huskars are good, but just like with the Turks, spearmen, skirmishers, no, not going to work well in post-imperial age. And their economy only gets worse. Their economy is frankly substantially worse than the Turks are. That being said, you do have some cool options available to you in team games. You can do some Ayrudzi donation, set up Karavanserai. In fact, the Karavanserai can bring the Armenian economy into a fairly healthy state in late game team games. So it's not as though they're completely hopeless. It's just in 1v1s, they want to close out the game in mid-imperial age or earlier if possible. And with that said, let's move on to some loose threads. Now that we know what the civilization looks like, what are some questions that still linger for me? Well, first of all, the architecture. I'm really not sure about it. Armenian architecture really doesn't look like the Central Asian architecture we currently see, but nor does it look like any other nearby architecture. It doesn't look like the current Mediterranean architecture, the Middle Eastern one, anything. So I did have one commenter in a poll a little while back mentioned wanting to see like a Roman architecture for like, or like late Roman, Romanesque, whatever you want to call it, for civilizations like the Byzantines, the Romans, and theory-crafted ones like the Georgians and Armenians. So maybe something like that could work well, but even then, I don't think it would be a brilliant fit. Something that unified Georgia and Armenia probably fine, but it really did look very different from what we see now for the Byzantines. So in summary, architecture, not happy with it. Another one, the Armenians were quite well known for their cavalry, and perhaps the civilization should have a bigger focus on it. They do definitely have better cavalry than their other unit types, but I didn't really want to give them an over large focus on cavalry since I felt like elites more broadly was a more interesting and unique way of representing the civilization. Plus they did have very heavily armored, effective infantry corps. So having it be entirely cavalry focused didn't feel quite right to me. And lastly, that town center drain effect, if it ended up being just too strong, could just be for the starting town center rather than ones you build after it. It's obviously mostly meant as an anti-rush mechanic, though I do like the effect that it has in making them much harder to push late game as well. Just might be a little bit too much sauce, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, and now let's look at some tabled ideas, some thoughts I had that didn't quite make the build, but I'd be remiss not to mention. Uh, for one, town center or other fortifications below 50% HP give bonus conversion resistance and armor. That could be quite cool. What about if villagers worked faster for every building of yours that was under attack on the map? That would be cool too, and a good eco bonus, but didn't quite feel right for history. And I think that if this civilization had a strong eco bonus, it would be very oppressive. Uh, another option was to rebrand them to a monk civilization. They were very well known for their monophysitism branch of Christianity. And a way of representing that could be that maybe the fervor technology gives a movement speed aura to the monastery. That could be quite fun. Uh, what if elite units got the effect that my current Swahili build has for villagers? Meaning that if you were, for example, to try to train a militia while only having 50 food, then that missing food cost would be replaced with gold. 
gold, making it cost 50 food and 30 gold. But I like the Zaranamak effect a lot better. Another one could be that elite unit upgrades each give plus one attack. A little bit boring, but would definitely make them more dangerous. I chose to go in the Azat Naxarad direction for this because it only is a lot more sexy and brings more specific terminology to the build. But I think that blanket bonus attack across some of the strongest units in the game could be very tough to balance satisfactorily. Uh, another option, what if having a lower score made your villagers work faster or make your buildings train faster? I, I tabled an idea for lower score on another build a little while back. It's a, a bridge I'm not yet willing to cross, kind of an extreme design choice you might say, but goodness me I was tempted. If any civilization deserves to be better when it has a lower score than its opponents, it's the Armenians for sure. Uh, and lastly, free sappers, or maybe villagers getting a bonus versus fortifications to represent them fighting off enemies trying to colonize their lands. It felt like kind of a useless bonus and would pretty much only be helpful versus tower rushes and similar, and would be so good against those as to make them literally worthless, which, oh no, not the tower rushes, it didn't feel satisfying to me. Uh, a couple of unique units and technologies options. First of all, a military police unit or rear guard unit called a Mart Petakan. I have no idea what it would do, hence why you don't see it in the build. Another one, uh, Sparahet, a unique technology. This was like the supreme military commander of Armenia. What if this allowed it such that when you did an attack move or a patrol, your unit steadily built up a charge attack, which it would execute when it finally finds an enemy. But if you re micro the unit, it would have to rebuild that charge attack from scratch. Very, very cool idea. I, I love playing with different types of move commands and, and rewarding micro or lack of micro, but this particular one didn't feel like it fit the build I was going for in quite as satisfying a way as my current unique technologies do. Uh, another one, representing the religious side of things, monophysitism. It's a very complicated metaphysical discussion. I'd recommend looking up a committed video on monophysitism versus, what is it, duophysitism or something like that, if you want to learn a little bit more. But this would just be a religious technology of some kind depicting the schism in Christianity between the Armenian and Byzantine churches. No idea what it would do. And plus, I didn't think a monk direction was what I really wanted to do in the first place. Uh, another unique technology, Gund. This was the name for a noble family's own family battalion. The cream of the crop that was sent to war as the absolute elite backbones of Armenian armies. This would be like some sort of buff to elites of the same type fighting together. It's kind of represented already by the current elite stuff I had, so I thought it was too far in that direction. Uh, Katskaras. This is a sort of monument or tombstone that was built en masse during the Armenian Middle Ages. And my idea here was that an Azat or Naksharar leaving a corpse would gain that town center drain effect in a little area around the corpse. I liked this Armenian build having mechanics to do with death and martyrdom and sacrifice. In this case, it could be like the Armenian people being inspired by some of their great heroes dying and as such doing that kind of general partisan type damage to enemies trying to invade their land. I love it. Could be easily convinced on this one. Tell me what you guys think. And with all that being said, we come to the end of this Armenian build. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed. Before we sign off, as always, let's take a look at the old likelyometer on a scale of one to 10. How likely is it, in my opinion, that the Armenians, maybe looking something like this design you see here, could be implemented into Age of Empires 2? And on the likelyometer, we have an 8.5 out of 10. I think the Armenians are quite likely to be included. Of course, there could be some political ramifications, but similar to some of the Chinese subdivisions I proposed, I very much hope that such issues can be overcome and this very deserving civilization be added to the game. But that's just what I think. Now I wanna know what you think. How did you like my build? What would you have done differently with the civilization? Do you think that I tackled the history well? Do you think that I did this people justice? And what else do you wanna see from me on this channel going forward into the future? As mentioned twice before, also be sure to check out my Enclave Kickstarter pre-launch page. Sign up if you want to get more notifications on it ahead of everyone else, though of course I will be advertising a little bit more on this channel. Link in the description down below. I hope to see you there and I hope to see you in the Discord channel. Also link down in the description. I forgot to mention it up until now. We've had some great conversations and I'm sure we'll have many more going forwards into the future. But until then, my name is Robbie Howell. And ciao for now.